We come now to what's called the pastoral letters. And these pastoral letters are First and Second Timothy and Titus. So we're going to try to deal with all of them um, in one fell swoop in one little lecture or one discussion. And again, these are the pastoral letters of, of St. Paul's work, First and Second Timothy and Titus. So let's get started. And here's a little video about uh, one of the issues that we're going to talk about in the class today is the issue, what happens when leaders, Christian leaders, fall in love with money or, or greed? And this is a little clip from uh, kind of the negative or the um, inappropriate ways that some Christian leaders have dealt with money. But let's talk about the pastoral letters. The reason why we call them pastoral is because they are for individuals, uh, Timothy and Titus, who are the those who are going to come after Paul, they're leaders with Paul, but really they're like the next generation of Christian leaders. So we're starting to see not only uh, people who have uh, you know kind of seen Jesus and then those followers of Jesus, but what happens about the people that they are leading to Christ, the disciples, right? The disciples of the disciples. We're starting to see Christianity become a more established movement um, in letters like these. So what we'll find here is that they are written to deal with St. Paul's concerns about the church and his leadership as a pastor, particularly what does it look like to have future leaders, right? Um, so in these letters, we believe they're written to help us understand how a church leader should function, what their job should be. Again, it shows us that second generation, so the disciples of the disciples, and it also is helping us understand that Christianity is now going to make it as a, a religion, and it's uh, beginning to become established. So some themes. Uh, clearly, Jesus, in these letters, Jesus has come to save sinners. He is the Savior. There's also a sense of duty, a leadership and duty, and what is sound doctrine or teachings, and proper order. So there is, I have to admit, that there is major author controversy of first and second timothy the question is did paul write these letters now the previous uh, letters that we've talked about there has been no controversy right romans first thessalonians no one um, no bible scholar thinks that they've been written by anybody but paul but when we come to first and second timothy there is some issues some people think that this is a good example of what we call pseudepigraphy um, false authorship uh, maybe one of Paul's disciples writing these after Paul's death um, in his kind of spirit. So not intentionally to try to cover up something as it is to carry on. And um, we kind of this controversy, let me just say why, why some people think Paul did not write them. Because there is a different literary style and different vocabulary between books like Romans, Galatians, and 1 Thessalonians, as it compares to the 1 Timothy. Um, this, these letters seem to be talking about a movement that is very established, which a lot of historians and Bible scholars feel like was not the case for early Christianity in the years 60 to 68 CE. Christianity was still this like fledgling little um, offshoot of Judaism. But by, by the reading of these letters, it feels like it's kind of an established thing. And um, also some progressive scholars do not like the way that these documents talk about women. So it, they would like to see it not being written by Paul. It makes it easier to maybe um, dismiss straight on the surface as opposed to really um, having to go after some of the things that are said in this text. Because in many moments, it seems kind of controversial or um, contradictory to what the author is saying here in comparison to what the author says in some of the other New Testament letters. So uh, again, just to kind of explain what pseudepigraphy is, it's false authorship, not uncommon in ancient literature. Oftentimes people would write to honor their teacher, so they would take on their teacher's name. Uh, sometimes people would do this to gain um, circulation of their documents, claiming it's being written by somebody. Now, if this is not by Paul, right, if this is really pseudepigraphy, then why do these letters go to such detail that they give, they give detail that would really only be written uh, by an actual author? So for example, look at 2 Timothy, not first, but 2 Timothy chapter 4, 
um, verse 13 in, in the writing, if this is not Paul, my question would be, why would someone just trying to claim Paul's authorship, why would they put details like this? Um, verse 11, 2 Timothy 4, 11, only Luke is now with me. Get Mark and bring him with you because he's helpful for me in my ministry. I sent Thicacus to Ephesus, and when you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas and my scrolls, especially the parchments. So why would you put an order in for a jacket and particular papers? This really wasn't written by historic Paul uh, to his readers who would know what he was talking about. Now, the other hot take of, this, of these documents is the issue of women leadership. In uh, well, let's just be honest. Okay, the question is: Can you know? Does the New Testament outlaw or ban women leadership in church? Does it say that women cannot preach, be priests, be elders? Um, should women simply, you know, have children, keep quiet, um, care for their husbands, or can women be full, complete leaders of the church? Well, let's look at the writings of Paul and the overall umbrella document for all of Paul's life is the book of Acts. And in the book of Acts chapter 16, we see a woman named Lydia, who was a leader of a house church, operating somewhat like a pastor. Um, in chapter 18 of the book of Acts, we see a woman named Priscilla, who was a dominant preacher in the book of Romans, Paul's great first work that we encounter. He mentions nine different women at the last chapter in Romans, and one of the women he refers to as a co-apostle. When we get to 1 Corinthians, we find out that Chloe, a woman, is a house church leader. Also, we find out that in Paul's writing about Ephesians, when he talks about women should, um, you know, respect their husbands, Paul actually puts more pressure on men than he does women. He says husbands are to lay down their lives for their wives, loving them as Christ loves the church. Also in Paul's writing of Philippians chapter 4, verse 3, Paul names a woman and says that she is a co-laborer in the faith with Paul. So kind of um, a, a kind of co-equal with him. And so what do you do with this? Because... All of this sounds like absolutely Paul is completely in and for women leaders, 100%. But then you get to a place like 1 Timothy chapter 2. So let's look at 1 Timothy chapter 2, and I think it'll be pretty clear you'll see the controversy that arises. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8. Therefore, I want men everywhere to pray, lifting up their holy hands without anger or disputing. I also want women to dress modestly with decency and propriety, adorning themselves not with elaborate hairstyles or gold or pearls or expensive clothing, but with good deeds appropriate for women who profess to worship God. A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. For Adam was formed first and then Eve. Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and she became a sinner. But women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. Whew. So what is it? Can women be house leaders and preachers, or shall they now be silent and not teach? We know that 1 Timothy tells women should dress modestly, no fancy hair or jewelry, learn in silence and full submission, not permitted to teach or to have authority, and that somehow Eve was deceived first, who led Adam into sin. Um, so what is it? Well, the overwhelming majority of Paul's writing affirms women leadership. So you can see why some scholars think that 1 Timothy was not written by Paul, because it seems to be contrary to what Paul was teaching. So I'll leave this up to you to wrestle with. Um, but my, my question is, when we have these contradictions, right, or at least appearing contradictions, how do we settle it? And my way that we settle it, my insight is that we always go back to Jesus 
what did Jesus say? How did Jesus operate? And when Jesus was raised from the dead, who were the first people that Jesus told to proclaim and preach the message of his resurrection? Women. It was the women and followers of Jesus who Jesus put this in their mouths and said, proclaim the resurrection, which is the core of Christianity. And my understanding is that if Jesus thinks that women can proclaim and lead and make this truth known, then I think that Paul is saying that women can make, uh, proclaim and preach and, and make this known. There must be something specifically going on in the congregation, in the community that Timothy lives in that, that indicates that Paul would have to give this kind of advice. Most likely it's because women in this, in this place were not educated um, and uh, Paul is encouraging the husbands to go home and teach their wives, which would be revolutionary, right? Um, to, to, to command that women receive an education. In this text, we're also gonna find out that as Paul, or as the writer gives um, insight about leadership, he says that um, people are to um, entrust those who are faithful with further leadership. We call this apostolic succession. So as Jesus found leaders, hence the disciples, Peter, James, John, etc., they then will find leaders who then will find leaders. And you can trace it all the way back to Jesus. Jesus who picks Peter, Peter who picks a disciple who then picks a disciple who now is continuing to still pick disciples today. Um, but as we think about 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, we have to ask this question of who in the world is Timothy? Well, it turns out Timothy was a young Christian leader. We meet him in the book of Acts, chapter 16. His father was a Greek, his mother was Jewish, and he literally is the embodiment of Paul, what Paul is talking about. The idea that Jews and Gentiles can come together and create a beautiful force for the Lord, and Timothy is an example of this. Uh, Paul has no closer earthly relationship than Timothy, this young man. Uh, Paul sees Timothy as his son. Now, they were not biologically related, but um, Paul takes him on um, as his heir apparent. So in 1 Timothy, we're going to see a warning against false teachers. And how do you have appropriate church uh, order? So the false doctrines or false teachings that were arising, those people were getting lost in um, things like genealogy, myths and speculations, and meaning, meaningless talk. Uh, they were forbidding marriage, um, demanding that you couldn't eat certain foods. And Paul says this is just all foolish, right? And that they were also pushing on Timothy because he was so young. And Paul challenges these, these people to say, Timothy is he's a good leader and that people should listen to Timothy. And here's what Paul says. This is 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11. Command and teach these things. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech and conduct and love and faith and purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of scripture, to, to preaching and teaching. Do not neglect your gift, what was given to you through the prophecy when the body of elders laid their hands on you. AKA, just because you're young, you preach, you teach, you lead by example. And um, I'm very inspired by this because Paul is encouraging Timothy to keep going and do what he knows is right. Now, when it comes to church leadership, Paul outlines some very clear things about church leaders, and he mentions some roles. A bishop, an overseer, one who would be responsible for churches. He says they must be above reproach, faithful in marriage, temperate, sensible, hospitable, and here are things they cannot be. They cannot be a drunkard, violent, wanting to fight, lovers of money, um, and a recent convert. And Paul also says that you should look at their household. Are they managing their family well? Are their children submissive? Um, are they thought of well, are they thought of um, in a good way by outsiders? Because you don't want someone who can't leave their own home and or has all these problems with addictions, um, whose family is run amok, 
who's just out for money and gain and power. Paul says this can't be the case. Also, Paul talks about a second group of people called deacons. We met this group of people in the book of Acts. So bishops are ones, or overseers are the ones that are responsible for the, the preaching, the teaching, communion, baptism, this kind of thing. Deacons, on the other hand, are people of the church who can preach, but also that they then serve out in the, you know, serving the, the poor, the hungry. They're out doing kind of the, the, the more hands-on kind of stuff. And they are too to be, they're also to be blameless, faithful in marriage, managing their, their, their household, um, serious in their faith. They can't be double-tongued. They can't be drug or, drunkards. They can't be greedy. And then Paul, so Paul also gives um, insight about those who will be locally leading a local church. He calls them elders, and he gives um, um, qualifications for them also. Now, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, uh, Paul finishes his writing by talking about money. And sadly, even the earliest parts of Christianity, there were some leaders who were using their position in the church to gain money and to be very greedy, right? It's not a new problem, a very common problem that happens. Anytime there's money, there'll be greed. And some churches, some uh, ministers were using their positions for financial gain. To hear this, here in um, verse, verse three, this is 1 Timothy 6, 3. If anyone teaches otherwise and does not agree to the sound instructions of our Lord Jesus Christ and to godly teaching, they are conceited and understand nothing. They have an unhealthy interest in controversies and quarrels about words that result in envy, strife, malicious talk, evil suspicions, and a constant friction between people of corrupt minds who have been robbed of the truth and think that godliness is a means to great gain. So there are people who are trying to get financial gain. Paul challenges a view of money. And here's what he says, is that we in our life uh, came in with nothing and we're going to go out with nothing. That if we have food and clothing, that's what we need. That's enough. Food and clothing is enough. He also says for those leaders who uh, desire to be rich or anybody who really desires to be rich, that's actually a temptation and a trap that leads many people away from what they are called to be, which is holy, right, and good. The pursuit of, of, of um, wealth has caused many people to stumble. And Paul says, and this is really important, Paul does not say money is the root of all evil. The love of money. That's why Paul says the pursuit of wealth can be very dangerous, um, can lead people away from the faith. Because riches are actually based on a lot of uncertainty. You can be wealthy today and tomorrow can be gone. But God is the one who's providing all these blessings. And we are to be highly generous. That's how we deal with our money. We are generous. We are rich in good deeds. And we are always investing in eternity because that's where our ultimate harvest is. So uh, this gives us a little window into First uh, Timothy. And Let's talk about 2 Timothy real quick. Um, this letter is written as if it's Paul's last words, his last thoughts. Uh, many people think that maybe could Paul be writing this even from a place of um, house arrest? And Paul's contemplating his life, his labor for the churches. He begins to list people who've gone against him. And he's trying to give a final word or blessing to his disciple, Timothy. And in this, he offers Timothy a lot of encouragement, tells him, even though you're suffering, to guard your character, keep looking towards Jesus and the return of Jesus, um, share in Christ's sufferings, but avoid these false teachers. Don't fall into them, right? And here's what he says. He says, he warns Timothy uh, against any kind of, um, of evil age and says that the times are evil, um, but you continue to live a good life. And when you live a good life, he says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, this is powerful, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, 2 Timothy um, 3, 12. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus 
will be persecuted. So as you are living in this evil world and you're trying to live right, you will be persecuted. So, so Timothy is to learn from Paul's example and uh, listen to Paul over these false teachers. And, and Timothy is told that the Bible is God's word. It's useful and right for instruction and encouragement and that Timothy should hold on to the word, not to give it up, not to let it go, but to proclaim the message, be persistent, be patient in teaching, endure, do the work of an evangelist, and carry it out faithfully. Finally, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8, here's what Paul says, uh, 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8. These seem to be Paul's last words. I'm already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight, and I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, but not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. What Paul is saying here is his life is being spent. It's, it's, it's over, right? It's, it's poured out. He can't get anything back. He believes his death is soon, that his departure, that he's, he's tried to do well. He has fought this fight. He's tried to finish his race faithfully. He's tried to keep the faith. And now, simply for him, all that is left is this crown of righteousness that he awaits. And he pulls from an image that would have been common. Think about this, like, leafy kind of crown that you've seen maybe in movies. They put on the ancient um, Olympic victors. And Paul seems to indicate that the only thing left for him is when he meets Jesus face to face, that the Lord will give this to him. But not only just to him, right? It's not like when he dies, he's individually going to go off to heaven. But when he and everyone who has been longing for Jesus' appearing, when we together see Jesus, we receive this crown of righteousness. So Paul says, now, Timothy, it's yours. My life is over. Now I leave it to you. So this is First and Second Timothy. Titus, very similarly, very quickly. Um, Titus is a young man. Paul is also uh, ministering. The issue with Titus is that uh, there's some false teaching going along, going around. But really, the people Titus is dealing with are so difficult. They're wild. They're lazy. They're wicked. And Paul is telling Titus, "Don't give up. Uh, be self-controlled yourself." He gives specific instructions to older men, older women, younger men, slaves, and he simply says, um, don't, 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 don't give up, and to keep looking for Jesus' return. So this is Paul's pastoral letters.